I want to continue with Hosea and um, I, I know for some people they've never heard of Hosea, let alone the outrageous story that goes with it. But um, I, I hope you're following what's happening here with this prostitute wife that was called Goma. And I want to look today, uh, to begin anyway, just to go back to chapter 1, verse 8. When she, that's Goma the wife, had weaned Lo Rahuma, she conceived, gave birth a son. The Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Then, in chapter 2 and the first verse, it says, Say to your brothers, Amy, and to your sisters, Rahama. Now, I, I am certain that it's about 1% that understands what's going on there. So let me <clears throat> translate that into more obvious English. That let, let me go back to this. When the Hebrew people named either themselves or specifically their children, they named them in sentences. Now that, I know when you read the scripture and you read Abraham, you don't realize that in the Hebrew language you've just said a sentence. Um, and prior to his being called Abraham, you may remember, he was called Abram, which again was a sentence. And I could keep going. Every name that you read in the Old Testament is a sentence, or sometimes it's a complete idea. But never did they name their children the same as we do. When, you know, my, my parents, they, they had the name Smith, of course, and so Malcolm sounds a pretty good name to go with Smith, um, as, you know, opposed to John Smith or something. Ma Malcolm is good. It's got no meaning to the parents, usually, uh, at all. A and it's just a way of calling someone. It's better than saying, hey, you. So we, we give a name. But when I come to the scripture, names, and I hear this, names were sacred. They, they looked upon names as being dropped into the parent's heart by God. And therefore, when they named their child in a little sentence, that name then described the child. And I don't mean just because, well, that entity is called this. I mean, it was a sentence that described who the child is in their very inmost being. It described their identity. And they grew into their name. They grew into what that name said about them. And it became the guiding light. It became the North Star. It became the magnetic north. It was, the, we moved, that's me, that's me, that's my identity. And, um, well, Abraham means the father of a multitude. I know it's hard for us to think that when, when the Hebrews spoke to Abraham, they were saying father of multitude. Uh, we don't think like that. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, the word means God is my judge. That is, within my lifetime, God will judge and make everything right. Um, I could keep going. Every name was a sentence, but it identified the child. And it was sacred. God gave me this name, and I'm growing into this name to become this name. Um, you have to understand that as you read verses like this, that it says... In verse 6 of chapter 1, name her, this little child, Lo Rahuma. What does Lo Rahuma mean? In plain English, it means that the, the, this child does not know the compassion of God. This child doesn't know the love of God. And in, in that sense, is, is walking out into the world without any sense of what we've been seeing in the last weeks that the agape doesn't understand agape and, and then she has a brother lo ami 
and, and that means that the child has no sense of belonging. I don't belong. It's hard to put into English. Uh, maybe I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. Um, terrible. But that was reflective of Goma, the, this woman who was in a marriage in which there was no love. She was producing children that he says they're not mine. And, and, and the children bore these names which pointed to the woman but then also beyond that pointed to Israel in their um, relationship with God. But then, in chapter 2, comes the announcement from the Lord. He said, say to your brother, Ami. Oh, just a minute, I thought his name was Lo Ami. No, God has changed his name. And Ami now is one that... Um, is is received this this is one who he could say um he, he i'm somebody i'm a, i'm a person um and, and i'm not just a somebody i'm god's somebody I, I i found my worth and i know who i am in my relationship to god and then it says call your sister rahuma and therefore, that means loved and beloved. This child has come from Eros with its total unlove under the name of love. This one has come to Agape and knows love. Now, do you understand that that wasn't just a flippant? It wasn't say, okay, stop calling your kids. No, this, I say again, a name was sacred, and the words that were spoken carried with them, you could say, the very power of God. And so when he said this change that is coming, this unbelievable um, change that is coming to the family, that where there was no love, there shall be love where there was no sense of anything or I'm a nothing, uh, I've, I've become God something. That, that's what I want to look at. How did God arrive at that? How does God change our identity? That, that's it. Uh, at the source and center of our being, where our name, the, these true names arise from, that, that's my identity. How do I change my identity? That, that's the story here. And, and could I remind you that Baal, which this book continually refers to, and Goba was a temple prostitute in the temples of Baal. Please understand, this Baal was rooted in that word that we talked about from the beginning, Eros. And we're not talking about some paganism in ancient days. This isn't some weird religion that was believed by ancient people. Let me say it very carefully. Baal, Eros, is still with us today. Uh, and it changes his name. Satan always changes his name. He can't change his purpose, though. And um, so it's the same thing, same old thing. It's very, anything Satan does is same old thing. But it changes the name. And today, we find Eros all around us. I don't have to tell you, we live. America is 100% Baal society. And when I come into religion in America and in the UK and Canada uh, today, I am meeting with an Eros religion. And the reason I'm talking about this is really you, those of you that are joining us from everywhere, I am very well aware that many of you are coming out of an Eros religion. And maybe you, you didn't realize it, but in the last few weeks you're beginning to realize that's what happened. You're coming out of an Eros religion and the Holy Spirit is bringing you into agape, the love of God. How does that happen? How does it work? Okay, that's what it's about. God begins this chapter, chapter 2, with an announcement of purpose. 
incredible purpose. I am going to rebirth this family from being the ones who have no concept of love, no concept of who they are, to bring them into the beloved in their own consciousness and to know that they are God's somebody. And so, um, how does it work? Come to the very center of your being. Very few people visit that center. Uh, many have barred and locked doors so you can't get to the center because if I don't know who I am, that's a terrifying place to be. But if, if we can get to our center and, and in that center, the best way I can put it is where imagination really works. It, it's, it's sort of a, the heart movie. And in that movie, you see yourself. You're, it's that place at the very heart of your being where I look at I and say me. It's at the heart. The, the, in that place, it's where I, I speak of amness. This is who I am. I be, I is. I, me. It's, no one else can see that place. It is in the center of you. No one can hear what goes on there. Only me. I go into that center and I meet me. And that's how I see me. Now, I, I know what name was given to you by your parents, but the fact is that we still operate by Hebrew names because almost as soon as your parents had given you what we call your name, they went on to give you your real name in little sentences and in some terrible situations which are multitude today in Western society, um, we, we hear from our parents, you're no good. That's a name. It's a little sentence. You're no good. You're not like your sister. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Um, you, you will never amount to anything. And, and those little sentences, they become our name. We take that and we put it down there in that heart movie, that's who I am. We never put the names that were given to us at birth. They're, they're just what they call us. The names are the names that my parents said to me, but then my peers said to me, my brothers and sisters and cousins and uncles said to me, and, and, and I keep on taking it, especially as a child before you're seven years old, you have no editing possibility and so you just take what people say without editing and, and you take these names and this is who I am. I remember when I was working in Brooklyn with many of the kids on the street and, and th this fellow came and right across his forehead he had it tattooed, I am a loser. A and um, I asked him, what did you put there? He said, that's my name. He said, that, that, that's my identity, I am a And he was deadly serious. And what, what can you do? The man has an identity. It was obviously given to him early in life. That was his identity at heart level. And when it's at your heart level, it's something we have taken and we take it to ourselves. And in that place, we hear the whispers of Eros. And Eros, if I could remind you, is that terrible satanic force. It's got nothing to do with God or even decent humans. Eros says, I only want the highest. I only want the best. I don't want, I reject the ugly. I reject the failures. I don't want even to look at those who don't make it. That's Eros. And when we are in that world of eros, then I look at myself and I say, I'm a failure, I haven't made it. Or as the kid in Brooklyn, I am a loser. Uh, they, be, they become our names. A and when, when you're, whatever that name is, or sometimes a multitude of names that all agree together, uh, that's where my thoughts come from. 
Your, your thoughts don't just happen. My thoughts arise, and if it's what we're talking about here, then it's like poisonous gas in a swamp. The, 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 the gas rises, and we, the, the thoughts that come into our head, uh, and they're negative thoughts because they belong to a person who's already been damned by their own name. And, and huh, I, I, that's where my imaginations come from. The imagination, people live in fear, they live in anxiety, all in this non-stop movie of the imagination. Why? Because it's coming out of a name that's already been determined as a failure and hopeless and a loser, whichever way it comes over. You, you look at people that, that become kind of national news criminals or whatever, and you wonder where did that come from? People aren't born that way. No, it was a name given to them by an abuser. And, and, and then the thoughts come, and then the actions follow the thoughts, all out of that center. Center. Eros is a lie. It comes from the original liar. It's the twisting of the beautiful love of God, which is the reverse. Agape that reaches out to give himself away to all, and that includes the least and the less and the ugly and the failures. He comes and gives himself to, that's agape. Eros says, I don't want you. You're not good enough. You've got to try hard enough to be acceptable. And of course, religion is built on that. Many people this morning are being given an Eros message not a thousand miles from here. They're sitting in church as they have done since children and they're being told you're no good and they're being told if you try harder, maybe perhaps God will love you. That's Eros. And it goes under the name of religion. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I'm an unworthy trash. I belong to nobody. That's the name of the child. Lo Ami, not my people, not one of mine, a nobody, a nothing, that's how it is. You see, down there at that center, if ever I get down there and dare to listen, the question is, who am I? Who am I? It drive you to suicide. Who am I? I don't know. I don't know who I am. Why am I here? Where am I going? Am I a person? And then again, religion comes in and says, no, you're not. You're unworthy. You're no good. God doesn't want you. And so it, it, some of my names that are whispered in that center are very religious and bear Christian words in them because they're, they've been twisted. Nobody. So what do we do? We seal off that center. I don't want to go there. I, I've talked to some people about this, and they become agitated and tears in their eyes. They can't even handle talking about it. So what do we do? We seal it off, and we now define ourselves exterior, way out here, by what I do, and all my accomplishments. And 90, well, maybe 100%, but a high percentage, you ask a person, who are you? And they'll answer by what they do. They have no sense that behind what I do, there is a being, there's a person. Who is that person? I don't want to talk about that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm afraid to even ask. I'm lost. So I'll come out here where it's safe. And that's why many people, after they retire, it's only a matter of a few weeks before they die, because they've lost their identity when they stop doing. Their performance is who they are, but that's a lie. I perform out of who I am. I am, I is, me. My performance, that changes. The, the day that I think of myself as I am a teacher, I'm finished. 
because it means the day I stop teaching, I'm done. No, there's a me. There's an I. Do you see what it's saying? But also, and I, I we, maybe one day we'll go there, but these are covenant words. If, if you're aware of the covenant, which we've done in months and years past, do you remember the main statement of God's covenant with us? I will be your God. You shall be my people. And, and you, you could put that I'll be your God. That is, I'm giving myself to you. Notice, I will be your God as if he's saying, possess me, I'm giving myself to you. It is agape. And then he said, when you know that, you will be my people. You'll have an identity. You'll be a person. You'll be one of my somebodies. And that's behind this when he says, no more love, you know, not a person. It's, it's, back, it's a covenant word, and the covenant word he's saying, you, you've, you've broken the covenant, you've forgotten the covenant. Did you even know there was a covenant wherein we are bound together by love? That, that's, the trouble is there's no neutral ground. There's no no man's land. If I am not in this covenant that agape makes with me, in which I know I am loved, and I know I am God somebody, if that isn't the case, I say again, there's no no man's land. I am then, like it or not, know it or not, in a covenant relationship with Eros. You, you can't say, well, I'm just sitting here thinking about it. No. We, we, by creation, we are made to be joined to someone. And if it isn't the covenant we were created to be one with him, then I find myself, but it's not a covenant. I shouldn't have said that. It's not a covenant. Eros doesn't know how to make a covenant because a covenant is giving myself away. Eros only grabs you into its black hole. Eros makes contracts, not, not covenants. And so that leaves me then my, my go-to place is a sense of despair. It's almost a safe zone. Have you noticed that? Some people feel very safe in the negative. That they don't know what to do in a celebratory life. Why? Because that's the way it is. We've been sucked into Eros, and Eros tells me I'm no good. Eros rejects me. But... What a but, even in the middle of the Old Testament. But God does not recognize our self-separation from him. He refuses to recognize it. He doesn't believe lies. He is the truth, and therefore he only speaks truth, sees truth, knows truth. And all of Eros and all that goes with it and all of our running away from truth God sees right through it to the truth. And the truth is that we belong to him. Like it or not, know it or not, you are somebody. You had the mark of your creator lover upon you. You're somebody. And like it or not, know it or not, you are the beloved of God not because of something you've done out here, but because of who God is. That's the truth. We live in the darkness, blind lie that twists it all, eros. And so he says this right there at the head of the chapter. This is what I'm doing in your life. This is what I'm doing with Goma. This is what I'm doing with the family. I'm going to reverse your names. It'll be an act of God to take the sacred sentence and turn it to truth. And you'll be called Ami and Lo Rahuma. That's, that's the truth. Okay, let me take that 
right to where we live today. Salvation must be the salvation of your heart, center, and imagination. And that is why there are multitudes who go to church and never get to actually living the Christian life because they went to church in order not to go to hell. And so everything is to do with the future after death instead of recognizing right now, as I live, I am operating out of a name that is a lie. And salvation means Christ comes by his Holy Spirit and throws light upon that. It means when Jesus died and carried us to death, it was that that went to death. See, I I don't know how you think about when you say, I died with Christ. It was part of your little finger or your big toe. Uh, what, What do you mean I died with Christ? I, the I that is twisted, the I that is distorted, the I that doesn't really exist. It's, it's, but it's mighty solid. But, but it, it's all the, it's, it's, we've quoted it how many times? Ephesians 4, that the, the, the mind, it's describing those who haven't seen the truth. And it says, their mind is darkened. It says that they walk in futility. I don't know where I'm going and I don't know who I am. That's futility. It says their understanding so dark and they're ignorant. It was that that Jesus took to the cross. It was that that he died with. He carried your twisted, darkened mind and imagination and heart where all the lies originate. And he took that and was crucified. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Has I been twisted back? I with all the knots taken out. I with all the lies washed out. I, but not I, it's Christ who lives in me. Where? In my liver? In my kidneys? Where does he? In that center So it says in 1 Corinthians 2 that we now have the mind of Christ. And the mind means imagination, seeing myself, seeing God. That's where it all is, you see. And he he calls us by the name that he knows is our real name. Beloved. That's how it is. That's what he does. The center of our being. And so at the head of the chapter, he announces this radical. I hope you got the idea how radical it is. It's, it's just not now we're going to go down to the post office and change our name. Um, I mean, that's difficult enough. But th- th- this is your identity, your name before God, who I see myself to be. He says, I'm going to change it and that change demands a lot more than a signature on paper and that's a change in my identity so it's knowing myself as god knows me your name will no longer be low ami but ami beloved you see and this is a grace intervention that brings us to know who we are let, let me illustrate it. We've done this before, so I won't stay long. But um, Israel, the people sort of behind this book, um, they, they'd all, they kept on. They never really got it. Uh, they, they were called by names that are almost too sacred to mention. Uh, the, the, the wonder of God's love in their life, and they forgot. Forgot very quickly. And do you remember when they, they faced the um, giants, for the want of a better word, in Canaan, do you remember? that They said, we are grasshoppers. The, the people who were God's somebodies 
we're grass, we're insects. And of all the insects, they could have said we're tarantulas, but <laughs> no, grasshoppers. You know, I always say, go walk in the field and they'll jump on you. And they've got those big eyes and they look up at you. You know, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to do this there. You know what I'm saying. And, and as it goes with identity, it's a perfect, they're in numbers, what is it, chapter 13. They, they said, we, we are in our own sight. They said it, it's laid out. In our own sight, we are grasshoppers before the, these people. And therefore, we are grasshoppers in their sight. No one ever told them that. They, they made that up, as we all do. We see ourselves through the eyes of Eros, the lie, and we hear the whispers. And have you noticed that voice inside always sounds like your voice? Oh, it sounds like me giving, uh, and it's the lie, from the liar. This is who you are, and he puts us down, and you're no good, and you're unworthy, and God couldn't love you. Well, if that's the case, that's who I am. So you must see me the same way. So I'll hide from you. I'm, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid because I'm no good, you see. Just the same. I remember, and it wasn't too long ago, um, I could repeat it from long ago, but this was quite recent when, actually, you do it. Um, Cheryl said to somebody, who, who was a professing Christian? They, they said, you know, you're, you're beautiful, you're loved of God, and you're good in his eyes. And they teared up, they got red, they didn't know what to do with themselves. And repeated the I'm good, am I? I'm good. Poor chap. He, he, he was just repeating what he'd heard down in his center, that he's no good, he's unworthy, and God doesn't love him. That's the lie. That's, that's the name the liar gave him. But you see what happens. Um, if, if I go to my fellow Christian and say, I am the beloved, I'm the apple of his eye. They say you're you're proud. You see, we're supposed to say we are most miserable sinners. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed. No longer, that that one now. Now you're being humble. No, no. You see, humility is speaking the truth. Humility is the simple truth. This is who I am. No more than that. No less than that. And to say the whole jolly lot comes because I'm in union with the God who loves me. That's humility. I am somebody. I am a child of God. I'm a familiar of the Father. I live in Christ face to face with the Father. That, that's not pride. That, that's simple truth. Simple truth. And, and of course, the trouble is that all my actions arise out of how I see myself. Your, your identity announces the limitations of your life. If that's who I am, I can only go so far within that limitation of who I think myself to be. I waste a whole lifetime in the prison of my identity. And I say prison because it's a false identity. It's a religious identity. Okay, let's put it this way. Idolatry. And we think that all belongs to the Old Testament or to tribes in Africa. I, idolatry is, is it's a matter that I, I, I have said to the true God, I don't like your way. I've invented a new and better way. Uh, and my invention, I'm going to give flesh and okay. it's idolatry. But idolatry then is the product of a dark imagination. Does, does that make sense? Idolatry is not just sticking up a, a stick and worshipping it. Um, before you put the stick in the ground to worship it, you thought about it. And, and you had imaginations. And based on your imagination, you cut down the stick and you shaped it, you fashioned it, you put it in the... It's an imagination where you are creating in your mind a God that's different and contradicts the real God. Well... 
if my imagination is dark, if I'm broken there at the center where I imagine who I am and imagine who God is, then idolatry means I've lost my ability to hear what God is saying because I'm now locking my imagination into something else. You see, the newness of God has never entered into the imagination of man. It's beyond us. And that's why in that scripture I just quoted from 1 Corinthians 2, that we have the mind of Christ. Do you remember what it says, the, the, the sentence before that? It says, quoting the book of Isaiah, he said, I has not seen, ear has not heard. It's never entered into the heart or the imagination of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But the Holy Spirit's told us all about that because we have the mind of Christ. That is that old imagination that couldn't imagine the love of God, couldn't even think it. Now the Holy Spirit has come in and has opened our eyes and we can see who we really are and what we're really destined to be. We now think with the mind of Christ, not with the mind of Eros. And so I say Jesus took it to death. That talk about <clears throat> he died for our sins. Be, be more specific. Where do those sins come from? What is sin? And you have to go right back there to the heart where we have twisted and distorted and we think on, we meditate on, we say, this is who I am. That, that name, that little sentence name that Satan gives us and we believe it. He took that to death. And he rose from the dead, and the first words he said to Mary, the first human after the resurrection to meet him, he said, I ascend to my father and your father. Get it. You've got a new identity. God is your father. He's my father and your father. It was a change. You know, um, that word, the biblical word, instead of repentance, metanoia, which means that radical enlightening of the mind to see and understand truth. Um, well, it, it begins in the imagination. It begins right there in my heart. That's where I see God as he really is. And then that's where I see myself as I really am. Metanoia, that radical change where the Holy Spirit teaches us. That's what this chapter is saying. I say it again at the head of the chapter. He's going to, there's some pretty rough things he's going to say in the following verses. But he, but he said, Let, let's get this straight from the beginning. This is where we're going. And, and so what, what arrests me in reading all of these chapters is that God himself is involved in this process of introducing this poor, wretched family to know his intimate love so that this whole thing is under the picture that Hosea was going through in real life. He said his marriage. I mean, let that sink in. God says, my relationship with you, you've got to understand, is on the same idea as marriage. Same class change. So he's not the great remote creator. He's not the governor of the universe. He is all of that. But he says, the relationship I have with you is not that you grovel before me as a creature slave. It isn't that you're just saying, I'm no good, I'm no good. Um, forgive me, forgive me. No, he says, I, I have forgiven you. And I have filled you with my spirit. You're somebody. You're my child. And, and, and therefore, it's the image of marriage. And, and j just think about it. If every morning 
at breakfast, I got on my knees before Cheryl and said, I'm no good. I failed you in thought, word, and deed. You know, I can't imagine why you would even look at me. And she would say, I am too holy to look at you. And well, that's religion, isn't it? That's what people are being taught this morning. No. And it's marriage to Goma, this woman of the, the book. Or to put it this way, he didn't say this just to a streetwalker. You know, he didn't uh, just any woman. This is a woman that Hosea had gone to the temple of Baal and had got this prostitute. We have her name and was married to Hosea. And the message is, that's, God says, that's my dealing with you. I want you to see it in that, what's going on there. How, did, did you hear? You see, he's got a unique relationship to this woman. She's just not any woman. You see, it's my, my woman, my woman. We got married. And, and you have treated me like a piece of dirt. You've walked out on me, you've gone to, but it doesn't make any difference. I married you. You're my wife. And that's why I'm coming after you. That's why I will not leave you nor forsake you. That's why I'm going to follow you wherever you go and keep telling you I love you because you are my wife. It's already got a unique relationship before we even get started, really. You see, a broken contract is punishment. You know. We had to Spain come to our house the other day. We had a contract. And in the contract, it's they promise to do the work. I promise to pay them for it. It's a contract. Well, if, if I came, they did the work, and I, I said, I'm not going to pay you. Okay, the contract comes in. There, there's a punishment for that. You'll pay for that. That's a contract. But a broken covenant... Well, that's a different matter. Covenants don't have punishment. In fact, covenant, it means you, you break it, I'm going to pursue you. I, I just don't walk out on a covenant. If, if, if it's a covenant, it carries with it a heartbreak. And that's why this book is filled with, with God pleading, God weeping over the people. You just didn't, you know, I didn't just break the Ten Commandments. This isn't a contract. God has entered into covenant with us. He's given himself to us. And the only thing on the planet we can make an image of is marriage. He's bound himself to us. So he continually comes to this woman, continually, and says, I love you. I love you. What are you doing I love you, and I'm going to get you. And when I get you, this is the blessing I'm going to put. This is the love you will come to know. promise you. You won't let her alone. It's the same as the, the shepherd that Jesus talked about. He said, my, she my sheep is lost. He didn't go hunting wild animals. He was looking for my sheep. He might have found other sheep along the way, but they're not mine. They'd, I, I'm looking for my sheep. He said to this one, you are my woman. He says to us, you are my people. You're lost, but you're mine. I mean, the, the woman lost her coin. Well, if you lose a $100 bill, it doesn't stop being a $100 bill. It, it might fall into the Pacific and lay on the mud, but it's still a $100 bill doesn't lose its face value. It's just out of currency right now, out of circulation. It, it, it means I, I'm not getting the benefit, but it's my $100 bill, and it's still worth $100, even though it's lost in the mud. You belong. You're not just a thing that emerged out of an ape society. You, you, are, you are his person. You're my person. And because of that, your worth is still there. He says, you're mine. I'm coming. I'm coming. And, and, and so 
you have right here. It's an encounter. An encounter with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I, that's my word. But as I read, that's the only way I can say it. That this woman, Goma, and all those who are sort of in the background that he's really talking about, it's an encounter. It's God stands in front of her. And we, we, an encounter, confrontation. It, it means, the word means an unexpected meeting. I encountered. I, I, I suddenly come face to face. Sometimes it's dramatic, sometimes it's casual. I could come home and say, you never guess who I met. You know, it was a confrontation. We weren't expecting it. It wasn't in our playlist. We an encounter. And, and sometimes encounters can leave you unnerved, upset. In, in fact, encounter, you, that's just got the beginnings of an idea to the word. It, it's a fight. You encountered someone. Um, but that that's it. Um, God encounters me, which, which it's love, love that has already died for me and risen again. Love encounters me, but it can be very unnerving, it can be very upsetting. On his way to changing my identity, to the identity of truth, it can be very upsetting because he encounters me and he is bringing my present journey to a screeching halt. And he is saying, no more. This is lies and you are lying yourself to death. That, that's upsetting because that probably is going to include all my life that I know of life. It's He's confronting me. Of course, it can also be ecstatic. Though very, very few people understand the best news they've ever heard is when God says everything you believe is wrong. <laughs> Thanks. That, that, that's my life is collapsing. It's over. Well, yeah, that's, that's I'm afraid that's, that's what it is. Because what you call life is not life. What you call wealth is not wealth. You're... you're so yes, love encounters you and says everything you believe is wrong. I, I've got to say this because it's happening too much. There's only one truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. He didn't say, I have a piece of it. Didn't even say, I speak the truth. He said, I am it. That's massive. Truth is person. And, and truth can't be divided into your truth and my truth. You know, you, you, have you heard? I, I've, I've talked to some people about this and their response is, well, that's your truth, my truth. No, yeah. Truth is not something that I made up. Truth is like a, a, an absolute. Uh, and uh, if I don't like it tough, it's truth. And Jesus is the truth, the one truth. And in that person I meet the love of God. And the love of God is the ultimate truth. But understand, he meets us wherever we are. I, I, I mean, he's meeting this lady on Bale Road. She, she's a Baal temple prostitute. And he's meeting her on that road. With all its corruption, all its shame, he's not afraid of it. He, he meets us where we are and loves us where we are. But in so doing, he does not affirm me in where I am. As I say, he's... Truth says to me everything you believe is wrong, and that's love speaking. He's not judging me. He's 
telling me that this, this is the best for you. Um, love, God love does not affirm me when I'm wrong. God love is not that sloppy thing that doesn't want to upset you so we just let sleeping dogs lie. Love will kick the dogs in the ribs and say, get up, you know, you've got to get out of here. Um, because there is, and they, and I'm saying this really because people have said, you know, I say God is love, God is love. And they say, well, God is judgment. Um, no, God is love. But maybe you've misunderstood what love is. Love doesn't let you continue in what is wrong. God doesn't let us, he doesn't love us to death because he doesn't want to disturb us. Love, okay, put it this way, love is not a swamp. You, when, when, when you're talking of the love of God, it isn't that you're sinking into a mushy, uh, and oh, yes, God loves everybody. Yes, he does love everybody, but that doesn't mean he affirms everybody where they're at. Love loves everybody and meets us where we are. He'll meet us in our darkness. But he doesn't let us stay there. When he meets us, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. In my, back in the 80s and 90s as I traveled the world, um, it was fascinating. Fascinating. How, God, I went searching for it. I, I wanted to know, how, how did God speak before the missionaries turned up? Um, or what, how did God speak where missionaries are not allowed to go? That, that was fascinating to me. And, and sitting down with, with old, old persons in, in tribes in Africa, uh, of how God came to them. And, and so unbelievably better than any missionary I know could ever do, told them that what they were doing was not the way, that he was the way. And isn't that fascinating? God comes to us and reveals that he's the truth. And one I'm thinking of, you might have heard the story. And, and I ask him, how did you come to be a Christian? He said, well, when I was a young boy, they have no concept of age as we do. So I don't know how old he was, but... Um, he said he went into the forest and he looked around and he, he said, this doesn't fit what the witch doctor says. He said, the, the person who made me must be a person because I'm a person and it takes a person to make a person. Now, that's pretty heavy thinking for a tribe. And, and he went on from there and he says, if, if God made me, then he must have made the other tribes, which of course that too was big because they had their gods different to the gods of this tribe. But he says, I'm a person and I know that they're persons too. So therefore the person made me and made them. And then he said, and he likes us because look, he put fruit on the trees and he, we could make clothes out of the leaves and he went on and on of what he discovered just looking around him. And, and But who is this guy? I don't know who this guy is. And so he fell on his knees and just said, who? I called him who. And he said, thank you who for making me. Thank you who for your love in providing me. He did that every day. Went to the forest, fell on his knees and thanked the who. And he said, one day, he fell asleep. I think he had a vision, but he said he saw a great light and in the light there was the silhouette, he said, of a man. And the man said, I am the who. And, and I'm going to tell you my name. There will be somebody who will come to your village who will be white all over and carry something black and they will tell you my name. And of course, the missionary came some weeks later, white. She was a white girl of 18 years old, carried a black Bible. 
first missionary to that area. And he said, I went to him. I asked, what, what's his name? What's his name? <laughs> Jesus. I, I went to that missionary who was in her 90s now. And, and I said, do you remember? You know what this old fellow says? Oh, she said, I remember. Yeah, I was just a brand new missionary kid. And then I walked into the village and this naked man came and jumped on top of me and said, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Yeah. But he didn't go to that kid and say, well, you know, I am love. So you go back to the witch doctor. In fact, bring the witch doctor with you. It's every, I love everybody. and every, that, No, you're daft. It's not a swamp that you just keep sinking in the mush. It's firm, solid ground. When, when you know the love of God, you know this is the truth. And if that isn't the truth, God still loves you where you are, but he loves you to bring you onto solid ground. And that's what's happening in Hosea. He loves her, but he won't leave her alone. Continually tells her this, this is going to kill you. That the path you're on is the path of death. But he loved her unconditionally. Where she is, what she believes, he keeps on, he won't leave her. He's the Luke 15, of course, you knew I had to get there sooner or later, but um, Luke 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Jesus presents himself as the great seeker. He's seeking the lost. And in seeking the lost, he is the disturber of the lost. The sheep was having a great time as it was gradually killing itself. The shepherd disturbed the sheep. He said, we're getting out of here. The, the son came back home to, to the father with that crazy speech. No, in, and in his safety, he felt he could say, I'm, I've sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as your hired servant. I feel good about that. that that's, and the father disturbed him and trashed him. Get that speech out of here. He said, you are my son. That's disturbing to someone who is convinced they're not. You see, it's, um, that's who we're dealing with. Um, we're, we're dealing with, with the God who loves us, comes where we are, and will never let us go. And that's, that's what you have here. He came and he says, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to change your identity to the point where your very inner name that you call yourself will be changed. And I, I come back to, to what I said before, that this, this isn't a story you know, of 800 BC. Well, it is, but... The Holy Spirit takes the heart of this story, in fact, takes the very verses I've just used now, and in the New Testament, and says, this is what Jesus has done. He, he's changed your name. He's introduced you to love and your, your being as a, a worthy, important person in Christ. 1 Peter 2.9, if you wonder where it is. Um, and I'll come right back to what I said as we began. There are multitudes today that have been for a great part of their life in a situation which in these last two weeks I've called the eros or the, the twisted love. They talk about agape, God love, but then immediately revert to eros. So God loves you, they tell us. God loves you. But then, but you've got to try to please him. You've got to try and be better and dedicate yourself. And, and because I'm never good enough, that's why I continually dedicate, continually go and I'm no good. I'm, that, that's being humble. That's being, that's how I worship. I'm unworthy. I'm no good. 
That's eros. That's the twisted. The love of God is on God's shoulders. I don't have to convince God I'm lovable. I don't have to twist his arm to make him love me. God loves me because God is love. Now I can rest. God loves me to the point where he gave himself to me in Christ and carried me to death and raised me from the dead to sit at his right hand in Jesus Christ, face to face with the Father, in the Holy Spirit. Now that's, that's the gospel. It's what God has done. Faith is resting in what God has done. Eros says, I know he did that, I know he did that, but now you have got to convince him that you want it. You've got to convince him you're lovable. And that's where thousands of Christians live. That, that despair, I'm not loved, but I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm nobody. I hope God is happy that he, I'm, I'm unworthy, nobody. And that's the reason we're in Hosea. The, this is how God turns us from thinking of ourselves according to the lie. There is no compassion, there is no love, I'm unlovable. I'm a no-name person, I'm a nobody, I'm unworthy, forget it, I'm abandoned. And God comes and he changes us. Really, that's a weak word. It's a transformation. It's a transfiguration. It's a resurrection out of death. And I am made a new person. And it's a new person from my heart. The, many of our friends have never thought of themselves in terms of who they are in relation to Christ and what he has done, which the Bible calls the new covenant, the newness of life. So new that we've never imagined it before. We, we don't think about that. In fact, I find that the church in the Western world has, even at that level of imagination, twisted it to think dark thoughts. Mo most believers, we found this in our Bible school, just this reason I'm talking about it. Um, most believers, their entire imagination in terms of God thinks about what they call end times. And they think about then the judgments, the great tribulation and antichrist and damnation and hell. Boy, have they got an imagination for that. They use every last shred of imagination. A whole series of books came out of it, left behind. Um, it was pure imagination. They didn't, they'd had one little tiny idea from the Bible, and then they made a whole series of depressing, dark books. And I'm not. I've been to Con. We're going to talk about the second coming. Don't, don't talk about the second coming. They talk about all the hell that's going to break loose before the second coming. That, that's it. The imagination. And I say, look, I'm asking you to imagine what Jesus has done. He has brought heaven to earth. He has transformed us, filled us with his love. The only expression you could use is marriage or dancing or feasting, all those words are in the Bible. And I said, use your imagination. What does that look like? What, what do you look like in that? Oh, no, no. We don't go there. No. Don't go there. Imagination is sinful, they say. You don't use your imagination. <laughs> they use it more than I've ever used it. So, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not just saying these things. I'm giving you fodder for your Holy Spirit imagination. This is you. This is me. And he transforms us. 
gives us new names. In fact, and I'm finished on this, he says in this chapter that when I do this, when I change how you talk about yourself and name yourself, he said, I'm going to wash your filthy mouths out. Um, I think it's the message that says, I'm going to scrub your mouth with soap like your grandmother used to, you know, cloud. And what's he going to scrub out of your mouth? He said, I'm going to scrub the bales out of your mouth, the eros, everything you talk about yourself, you talk about yourself, you, you talk about God, and it's all filthy. He said, he used that word, not me. He says it's filthy, it's corrupt. You've twisted the beautiful face of God into some monster that's demanding instead of loving. You've twisted your own face. You've, you've crushed yourself with your dirty words. All eros. All I've got to be better. I've got to try harder. I've got to make God love me. And I hope God will show up today if I'm good enough. God calls that filth, corruption. He said, I'll scrub your mouth out. And I'll give you a new identity whereby you'll speak of how much you are loved. And yet you'll know you are God somebody. Well, there it is. Father, thank you. Because all this is so true. Thank you, you have revealed the good news of truth and light in the face of Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, open our eyes, our inner eyes. Kick down the doors that we have built around our emptiness. And let us discover you at work at the heart of our being, loving us as we are, loving to bring us to where you are. And to your hands we commit ourselves and every person who has heard every word that I've said. Lord Jesus Christ, amen.